All right, it's, yep, it is working. Wow, that's weird. I've never done this. I feel like Janet Jackson. Um, <laughs> so, um, so thanks for inviting me. Oh, I forgot to bring up a couple of props here. Uh, sorry. All right, my LSD glasses here. We'll get to those in a minute. I also want to take a picture so I can brag to President Trump about what a big crowd I had. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is the bigliest crowd. Okay, so um, immediately upon sending my slides to um, on, on upon Gosh, he said, "Oh, it's 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 coffee with curiosity." But I don't drink coffee, so um, for me, it's chai with curiosity. I've never been curious about coffee at all. All right, so uh, let's see if this works. Ah, oh, look at that. All right, so I'm interested in using mathematics to explain, let me say it in the broad sense, um, how patterns organize and arise in nature. Because if you think about nature, it, it's beautifully patterned. There's all kinds of temporal patterns, which i um, get to, and spatial patterns, and spatio-temporal patterns. And there's common themes to all this that have to do with things which I'll call dynamic instabilities. And I'll try and explain that to you throughout this lecture. Um, this particular thing I'm going to talk about, well, let me just get, I might as well get going here. So let me start with the first, first thing. These are some old... Um, stills of movies made by Edward Mybridge, who studied animal locomotion. Um, things like how an animal um, walks or trots or does gallops, and animals spontaneously switch from one of the, these are called gates, they can switch from one gate, there we go, they can switch from a walk to a trot as things speed up. And the reason they make this switch is a spontaneous instability of the walking gait that goes to another gait that becomes more stable. The trot's probably the most um, energy efficient of all the, um, all the, the um, gaits that animals can do. And then beyond that, if you go faster, you go into gallops and things like that. Another question, another thing that's very interesting is how animals get their... Um, stripes or spots. Now, I know Rudyard Kipling had some theories about that, but we have more modern theories um, that are, you know, are still asking the same question, how did the tiger get his stripes, or how did the lever get his spots? Um, and there, there, there are many variations of this, and there's been people that have been modeling this for 30 or 40 years. It goes way back. Um, Alan Turing in 1952 wrote a fundamental paper on the, called The Chemical Basis of morphogenesis, which he gave an explanation for how patterns could spontaneously arise just from having a bunch of chemicals together that had different rates at which they could move in the medium. So uh, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is fireflies. Um, I don't know if you have them here, but they're all over Southeast Asia. We have them in um, the United States, particularly in the East Coast. Um, the state which I'm from, Pennsylvania, the firefly is the state insect of Pennsylvania. I don't know if you guys have a state insect in any of the states in India, but um, in the United States we do. We have state trees, we have state flowers, and we have the Pennsylvania firefly. So um, they're pretty amazing. This is a, um, this, this picture is a recording just by holding up a camera and digitizing the light, a light sensor of a single insect. And this is a bush with thousands of them on, on, thousands of them on there. And you can see that, that the total aggregate of this is really close to the single one, which means they're synchronizing within a few tens of, milli, tens of milliseconds. So it's quite astonishing. So what are dynamic instabilities? They're transitions from one state to another governed by nonlinear equations. Now, as I, I saw here that you're only supposed to have what you learn in school. Well, I didn't know what school that meant. I, I, I assumed graduate school in mathematics. So, <laughs> but no, I, 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 I do have, I apologize for a few equation, equations up there, but I can't help myself. 
mathematics is going to uncover some of these common features because the way you model the brain is very different than the way you model animal stripes or the way you model um, how animals run or how soil, um, how ants form colonies that are spaced out. They all have different equations, but underlying these equations are similar principles. And so what I want to talk about are what are the basic principles of pattern formation. So I'm going to let you see this little video. There's a, um, a guy uh, who's a video, um, he's a video artist, and this is a trailer from his movie Synchronicity. Um, I've collaborated with this, with him on this. I don't know if you, it don't, you don't have to hear it, but what he does is he's going to have a light, and he's going to flash that light. And you'll see it there, it's a little LED light. And this firefly is going to start following it. And then eventually, you'll see that all the fireflies follow this light. So this is in um, probably either Thailand or Malaysia. This is where the, these are most common. Can you, yeah, you can see everything here. The fireflies don't make that noise. He's a video artist, so that's a musical background. And I don't know if you can, let's see, I think it's coming up. Um, there should be, you'll be able to see like, oh, whole field of trees, thousands of these guys synchronizing. So they congregate and they flash synchronously. It's not clear why they do this. Um, there's a lot of theories about this, why they synchronize. A lot of it, it's a beacon for sex in some sense because only the males flash and then the females all come. And, um, oh, Thailand, there we go. And there are, each one is affected by the other. Each, each firefly blinks on his own. He's a little tiny oscillator. And what happens is when he sees another firefly, he changes his rhythm slightly. So let me explain how this works, okay? So many of you probably have traveled overseas, and you know that we have something in our brain. Some of you might have heard of this. We have something called a circadian rhythm. That's a 24-hour rhythm that tells us when to wake up, tells us when to eat, tells us when to sleep, tells us when to do lots of things. And it's synchronized by the sun. And the way it's synchronized is there's a whole bunch of cells deep in the brain that receive direct input from the retina. And, these re and every time the sun comes and hits the retina, it shifts these rhythms in a certain way. So let me explain how this works. I hit the wrong button here. Sorry. There we go. I have to master this. All right. So let me, the red guy is the firefly flashing. Flash, flash, flash. He flashes very regularly. And at a certain time, a stimulus comes, a certain time after his last flash. And what that does is it shifts the time of his stimulus. Uh, the next flash, and if no more stimuli come, it'll maintain that time exactly at the same frequency as it was before. And if you measure the degree of speed up or slow down as a function of the time of this stimulus, you'll get a little curve that looks like this. And this is called the phase resetting curve. What's happening is if the flash comes right after he flashed, then he'll slow down because he says, I'm going too fast. And if the flash comes right before he's ready to flash, he'll speed up because the flash, because it says, oh, I'm going too slow. Let's speed up. So you can see that what this is going to do is if you're going a little late, you'll speed up. And if you're going a little early, you'll slow down. And that can push you to synchronize. So is that enough? So I'll show you a little simulation. Okay, this is in randomly placed fireflies with random frequencies. And let me start this video again. Okay, there we go. Pause. Ah. All right, this isn't, I haven't learned to control videos. I want to pause this. There, okay, there we go. Sorry, um, I'm not Mr. Technology. Uh, <laughs> all right, so there's in randomly placed fireflies. Each firefly 
We'll see guys in some neighborhood of his, okay? And when this guy flashes, he'll reset the rhythms of the neighboring guys according to where they are in their cycle, okay? And what's going to happen here is I didn't want you to sit through this because it takes um, many, many dozens of flashes. So what you'll see initially is sort of asynchronous behavior, but in the end... All right. At the end, you'll see it suddenly synchronized. Um, that's only because I've waited for a long period of time and it started the film again. I don't know what that was. <laughs> that's really weird. I didn't put that there. It looks like a thumbtack. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's some sort of secret Adobe thing. Okay. So now I want to kind of turn to the main topic that I came here to talk about. And that's hallucinations and antoptic phenomena. So most of you probably have heard the word in hallucination, all right? But you might not have heard the word antoptic. Antoptic means it's coming from within the optical system of the brain. And for those of you who don't know, the brain is up here. <laughs> I guess you know that, okay? And the eyeballs project back into various regions of the brain where they ultimately terminate in what's called the visual cortex, which is back here. You can very easily discover that that's the visual cortex by taking a heavy book and swinging it backwards and hitting the back of your head. And if you do that, you'll see flashes of light because you've excited your visual cortex. So I'll start this with some of the things that got me attracted to this is art in caves, cave arts. Um, you probably have seen pictures of these. There's caves in Paris or France and all over the world of paintings that were done thousands and thousands of years ago. And some of these are, you know, obvious designs like this lizard and other things, but other ones are much more abstract designs, such as these geometric patterns on these people, these spiral waves, um, various and sundry starbursts, and things like this. So um, anthropologists have thought these might have something to do with intrinsic behavior of humans because it, they, they see the same patterns across all cultures. In other words, you don't see elephants in every culture drawn or lions drawn, but you all see these abstract geometric designs. You also see this in, um, oh, that's right, I got this thing. So what do these upper ge ge geometric signs in upper Paleolithic art mean? Okay, compared to other modern cultures, such as the Bushmen in South Africa, um, Koso tribes in Arizona and Western United States, Tucano tribes in Brazil, and Australian Aboriginal tribes. So Hedge, he was an anthropologist, classified different kinds of Paleolithic art, and he had this stuff called mobile art and parietal art. I take parietal to mean it happens higher up in the visual areas than, than the primitive areas that I'm interested in. And here are some examples of antoptic phenomena that people report seeing during various and sundry things. I'm going to show you some of these. You're going to, afterwards, you can even try some of my device here if you're interested in. This is, and so these are some examples of kinds of patterns that people see and compared to various types of engravings that people have found in cave art. Um, he, he hypothesized that th this non-representational art was inspired, inspired by shamanic visions, okay? So if you go back, if you go to Brazil or any of these places, many of these tribes, um, there's many, many, many hallucinogenic plants out there. And those hallucinogens were invented to keep animals from eating them. But people <laughs> decided they liked the effects. It's like alcohol or anything else. And so people learned very on, 
very early on that if they took some of these substances, not too much of them, um, then they could have visions and, and learn a number of other things about their, themselves. And you can imagine sitting there in the dark in flickering light, chanting and doing yah, yahe or peyote or something like this, you'd start to see visions. And the idea is that the shamans, um, these, these kinds of um, chants and, and, and um, drugs and flickering light and things like that would lead to altered states and give rise to visions. And that was the hypothesis these guys had. Um, in northwestern Mexico, there's a whole um, there's a tribe, the Weechals, and they make beautiful, beautiful um, rugs. So you can see some examples here of the rugs. And they also make these beautiful paintings that are made out of beeswax and then colored yarn. All right? But most of the subjects of their yarn paintings are the hunt for peyote because this is one of these tribes which worships peyote and they have a whole church around it and they... Only certain people were allowed to eat it, the shamans and the priests. And they have the visions. And these are some yarn paintings, presumably, that are inspired by these visions. So now let me um, turn from speculative cultural anthropology to stuff that I'm a little more confident about. And that would be entopic phenomena which is visual images from within. So it's common in hallucinogenic drugs. It's also common in pre-migranous auras. If you have a migraine, sometimes before you have a migraine, you'll start to see flickering pat geometric patterns. Later on, you'll see these things called fortification illusions, which look like these zigzags that move slowly across your visual field. And then, um, my favorite subject is flicker and pressure phosphines. So let me say a few seconds of, of things about pressure phosphines. Some of the students in the course did this, and they'll warn you that it might hurt a little bit. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But here's something you can do. You can take the palms of your hands, close your eyes, and press the palms against your eyes. You know, if you have glasses, you take them off. And essentially what you'll see initially are little flickers. But then as you continue to do this, you'll start to see flickering geometric patterns and checkerboards. And those are occurring, they're, they're built into your, they're a consequence of doing certain things to your brain, <laughs> which is not normal. It's a sort of like, have, have you ever fallen asleep on your arm? And when you wake up, your arm's completely dead. When you press your eyeballs, what you're doing is pressing on the optic nerve. That's the thing that takes the information from the eye back to your brain. And you're stopping that flow of information. And your brain is used to having a common, constant influx of information, even if it doesn't do something with it. And it gets bored, and therefore, it starts to generate these patterns spontaneously. So here's some examples of phosphines. These are taken um, from Paleolithic art, but these are some that were um, drawn by subjects that had these kind of flicker illusions. Um, one of my favorite examples of flicker was there was a guy by the name of Brian Geisen, okay, who was a kind of this strange itinerant guy, ran around all over Paris and New York and stuff. And he invented something he called the dream machine. The dream machine consists of a cylinder with holes cut into it that is then put on a turntable. Now, some of you younger people only know of turntables from raves and clubs, but a turntable was what we used to play these things called records on. And records were these things that produced music that didn't involve MP3s or phones or anything. And you could put a cylinder with holes cut in it and light in there and then look at it and it would cause flickering light, okay? So Brian Geisen, and I don't know how much you guys are imbued with 60s 
and 50s and 60s beatnik culture, but the fellow here, over here, is William S. Burroughs, who is a very famous guy who wrote this really bizarre book called Naked Lunch, which um, everybody in my college read it because it was sort of a rite of passage for people that grew up in the 60s and 70s. Um, here's the only thing I say about saints. Um, um, Oliver Sacks, who's a neurologist um, who recently passed away, he, he hypothesized that St. Hildegard of Bingen had migraines because she drew these pictures look, that looked very similar to pre-migranous auras. And there were, there were um, references to her suffering from headaches. So there's the idea the saints come in. Um, of course, there was the 60s. These are some pictures that people drew back in the um, late 60s, early 70s. Um, this is a really pivotal, pivotal book written in the 1940s and then reproduced in the 60s called Mescal and the Mechanisms of Hallucination. Heinrich Kluver was a neurologist who studied people who took mescaline. And he found that no matter who they were across all kinds of cultures, in the early stages in which they took mescaline, they saw the same patterns recurring over and over and over again. These include spirals and vortices, funnels and tunnels, cobwebs and filigrees, exploding light rays, sort of like the Wheel of India, and mosaics and other patterns like that. So he called these things form constants, and he thought that they were somehow fundamental to the visual system. So before I go on to talk about form constants, I want to talk about the visual system a little bit. So everybody here knows the eyeball is a ball, right? That's why it's called an eyeball. So if you remove the eyeball and you look at it, in the back is the retina, okay? And you can think of the retina as a disc, all right? Just a disc, a circular, a solid circle, okay? And so images come in on that disc, and then they get transmitted back to the visual cortex. Now, the thing is, the visual cortex is shaped, the retina is shaped like a disc. The visual cortex is much more like a rectangle. So it turns out that there's a transformation that goes from the retina to the cortex, okay? This is called the retinal cortical transformation that takes objects in the retina and transforms them to cortical coordinates. So it's like taking a map and distorting it. Suppose you drew the map on rubber and then you started to stretch it in a funny way. It would change the shape, but it wouldn't change the idea that two things close by remain close by. Another important thing about this transformation is that it varies from how far out you are from the center of the retina. When you read, you have to look right at the paper. You can't, read an, you can't read a letter in your periphery. Your visual system doesn't have the resolution. So what happens is there's this expanding, you get more and more cells in the center and fewer cells outside. So the representation inside is a very small thing, and then as you get out to the periphery, it's much bigger. So you can see this in this transformation. Here, things get wider in the periphery, than they are in the center. This is on the retina, but when you transform it to cortex, it's uniform, and it's uniform stripes. Here's checkerboards. So for those of you who are physicists or anything, this, is, this transformation is essentially like something called the complex logarithm, okay? So basically, it takes these spirals and makes them into straight lines. That's the beauty of it, because we know how to understand periodic patterns. Checkerboards, stripes, horizontal lines, things like that. So the patterns become very simple when transformed from retinal coordinates to cortical coordinates. So recapitulating, there are common patterns in shamanistic art. 
you can transform these to geometric patterns in the cortex. So how do these patterns arise? So now we come to the question of how does the tiger get its stripes? How does the brain get these patterns? So to do that, I have to tell you a little bit about the brain, all right? So inside the box, all right? So here is an image. Here's an image of a recording from the brain of a cat that's staring at a screen. And the screen consists of lines that are moving of various orientations. And what happens is that parts of the, light, the brain light up. The red part lights up when a certain orientation comes on, and the blue part lights up. And these are organized into these kind of nice geometric patterns. So the brain intrinsically has a kind of spatial organization in it that lends itself to producing these kinds of patterns. So there's always spontaneous activity in the brain, but the brain has many, many, many brakes on it. Not like the cars in India, okay? It has many brakes, and these brakes keep things from running away in too excitable a way, all right? So the visual system itself is poised very close to this instability. Now, why would you want to be close to an instability? Well, Imagine if you were really, really stable, okay? So imagine that you've got a well, and you're a bull at the bottom of it. And the only way you respond is when that bull leaves the well. Well, it's going to take a real big stimulus to lift you out. Now, we don't want that to happen. We want to be able to react to stimuli very quickly. So that well is really, really shallow. And it doesn't take much to kick you out of that well. Does that make sense? So here's the parts of the brain. The parts of the brain consist of specialized cells. These are called neurons. Okay, And there's thousands of kinds of neurons. There's two kinds of people in the world that study neurons. There are the lumpers and the splitters. The splitters say there are thousands of kinds of neurons. The lumpers say there are two kinds of neurons. Excitatory, red, and inhibitory, blue. As you might guess from their names, excitatory neurons, when they fire, they send these things called action potentials, and they send them to other neurons, and that turns those neurons on. When inhibitory neurons fire, they send action potentials also, and that inhibits the other guys. So there's this balance between excitation inhibition, yin and yang, if you will. So why don't we always hallucinate? Well, the cortex is poised near this instability, and it's not at the instability. For some people, it is. Some people hallucinate all the time. People that have had diseases, there's various diseases which cause this. Um, you can take drugs. Well, that's, um, that's the drugs that can permanently damage you. There's... Um, Back in the 60s, people took a lot of stuff called LSD, and for some people that were super sensitive, they forever suffered these things called flashbacks. Brain was constantly stimulated all the time. Okay? So manipulation can push it past the instability. So for example, drugs, flisher, flicker, pressure, various and sundry things. There was a great book written in the 40s about the experiences of World War II, German World War II pilots. They would fly in high altitude, and the lack of oxygen would cause them to see all these visual geometric patterns. So basically, these things are ubiquitous, and you see them with just the slightest kind of manipulation. All right, this is the last math, I promise you. So. You, if you want me to just skip it, I will, but if not, I can kind of take you through it, all right? So this is called a differential equation, and differential equations are the lifeblood of the field of dynamical systems, which is what I do, all right? So I have to put what I do, all right? And what this just tells you 
oops, is the, the rate of change of something, that's what that symbol right here means. The change of activity is related to the current activity in a negative way, plus the inputs from all the other guys, okay? And there's some positive inputs and some negative inputs. So you want to imagine this is a little tiny chunk of cortex of the brain, okay? It has excitatory guys and inhibitory guys. And now we're going to hook them all up to make a big sheet of brain. Okay, there we go. That was it. No more math. All right. Well, I think, I think. Um, I can't promise. Um, all right. So now let's take a whole bunch of these little fellas, all right? I've arranged them this way and put them in a spatial array, all right? So this guy, this pink guy right here, he sends the outputs to many other pink guys, many other red guys, but he also sends outputs to other blue guys, okay? The blue guys, the inhibitory guys, do the same thing. They inhibit other blue guys, and they inhibit other red guys. So basically, you have blue guys, and this tells you the strength of how much you interact with the guy as a function of how far you are. So nearby guys, you inhibit the most, and guys that are farther away, you inhibit less. Nearby guys, you excite a lot. Nearby guys, you inhibit less. So when you put these two together, run this through all the nonlinearities, you get something that is effectively this, okay? What it's called is lateral inhibition, all right? Back in the 80s, we called this Reaganomics, okay? You help yourself and then inhibit everybody else, all right? That's not close to your cohort, all right? This is an economic plan, all right? So it's also called winner take all, all right? So here, this guy starts turning on and then he inhibits everybody around him. They don't get a chance to turn on. All right? Now, if you imagine taking this and rotating it around the center axis, you'll get a sombrero, or what we call Mexican hat coupling. Okay? So there's what the coupling looks like in two dimensions. So is this enough to induce pattern formation? Is this kind of connectivity sufficient? Well, let's see how this works, all right? So imagine that you have an array of neurons, okay? Now, if every neuron was exactly the same as every other neuron and exactly in the same state, then nothing would happen because my input to you and is the same as your input to me and everybody is getting exactly the same input. However, let's suppose a little bit of noise comes along or there's a little bit of heterogeneity. So what happens is this guy here gets a little bit of an advantage, all right? Does everybody, okay, he's getting a little bit of an advantage. What's going to happen? Well, because of this local positive feedback, he's going to start to grow more. He's going to push his advantage. But in the meantime, he's going to inhibit his two neighbors, guys around here, okay? You see that? But what are those guys going to do? Those guys normally would be inhibiting other guys, but you've removed their inhibition, so they are inhibi they're inhibited from inhibiting, okay? That's called disinhibition. And what happens is that allows these guys to build up and you can amplify these, and then this cycle propagates across, and what you get in the end is a very nice final geometric pattern. In other words, this kind of connectivity, what's called Mexican hat connectivity, is the fundamental principle that lies un underlies spatial pattern formation. This is how every model that produces stripes 
checkerboards, any kind of patterns. Have you ever looked at the drum? If you look at a drum, you get patterns when you beat a drum, okay? They aren't stripes, they're different ones, but that's because the shape of the drum is not a rectangle, it's a circular thing. All these things are the same thing. Here's a great experiment to do at home. Go home, take a frying pan, a black cast iron frying pan. Put a little ghee or oil in it, okay? This is going to work much better for you guys because in the East, in, in the U.S., you don't have the equipment. Sprinkle some turmeric on top of that. Then put that on your stove and turn the heat on. And what you'll see is that you'll see that that will break up into geometric patterns, okay? You put the turmeric on there so you can see them, okay? And that's because of an instability where the, the fluid heats up and diffusion can't propagate it enough, so it forms these cold spots followed by hot spots, and these give rise to these geometric patterns. So that's what you can do without manipulating your brain. Okay, so what do drugs do? Well, drugs, LSD, etc., have a common molecular mechanism. They bind to certain receptors called serotonin receptors. Some of you might have heard of serotonin. Um, there's certain drugs out there for, um, for um, um, depression called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, okay? And they bind to certain receptors in the brain and they increase um, glutamate. That's the excitatory transmitter. That's the thing that tells neurons to excite other neurons, okay? They're blocked by certain other things, so there's a high occurrence of these kinds of receptors in schizophrenia, too. Um, before I go on, I want to tell you a little story. Um, many years ago, I was talking about this, and a reporter wrote about it in the newspaper, and I got a letter from a woman that said she was very religious, and she used to pray with deep concentration, meditate. And while she did this, she would see all these geometric patterns, which she always enjoyed. But she suffered from some depression, and so they started her on some antidepressants. Antidepressants increase the inhibition in the brain, preventing the runaway excitation. And she said she no longer saw her visions anymore. So I thought, well, there's a great test of my theory. Um, <laughs> can't publish it, though. All right, so now let me tell you a little bit about those pressure phosphates. Okay? Remember, those are the things where you pressed your eyeballs. Okay? So what I'm drawing here is, is hard to understand if you're not a mathematician, but it's basically, that's the inhibition axis, that's the excitation axis, and this is the places where the rates of excitation and inhibition are zero. So where, this is the resting state of the brain. Okay? We'll imagine that we're sitting right there. So what happens when you press on your eyeballs is you're removing background activity. So you're taking away inputs to inhibition and excitation. And what that does is it shifts the red curve down and it shifts the black curve across, or the blue curve across. Paradoxically, in this particular case, it increased things along the E-axis, okay? And that's because there's lots of inputs into inhibition compared to excitation in certain parts of the brain. So by pressing on your eyeballs, you've para even though you've removed input, because you've removed more input from inhibition, you've made it easier for the brain to be excited. Now, there is a, it's hard to tell this is a movie, but there you can see, this is me with my LSD goggles, all right? And what LSD goggles consist of are, uh, here they are, I'm going to, these are um, a more robust version. Those are more, those are for experimental work. These are for um, parties. Um, <laughs> okay, these, these guys, um, you, you'll be able to put them on later on if anybody wants to try. Um, they, they produce flickering light, 
okay? And when you put them on, um, whoa, yeah. <laughs> when you put them on, um, you'll suddenly see geometric patterns, okay? And at certain frequencies, okay? So it turns out that people have been interested in these flicker phosphines for a very long time. And um, I've collaborated with a number of people, but these are sort of some of the simple patterns that people report seeing. They also see checkerboards, among other things. And so here's a model for how it works. Okay, before I get on to that, let me discuss the concept of resonance, okay? If you haven't heard of resonance, I'm going to explain it to you in a very simple way. Has anybody here ever gone on a swing? Okay. You know, the swing where you pump, right? No? All right, all right, all right, all right. We have them in the U.S., uh, but now, not anymore. Now everybody has to wear helmets and life jackets, and <laughs> they have to be on cotton carpeting no higher than two inches off the ground. But when we were kids, we would get on the swings, and you try and go all the way around, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also used to ride without seatbelts and had bikes without helmets, and we also didn't have sunscreen. So, <laughs> but anyway, you know, so maybe there are th some things better. But with swings, if you ever watch a little kid on the swing, he just randomly swings his legs and doesn't get anywhere. But when you learn, you learn as you swing at a certain frequency, you can make that pendulum start, I mean, the, the swing, you can think of the swing as what's called a damped pendulum, okay? So you know that a pendulum wants to be here, down there, because that's the stable way. It doesn't want to be up there. But if you start to swing it enough, you can induce it to want to go, just by a little bit of energy, you can induce it to want to swing more and more. So you can destabilize this state if you hit things at the right frequency. So the brain has many, many rhythms in it, all right? And among those rhythms are rhythms that are around 10 cycles per second, okay? They're called alpha rhythms. And Part of that, there's many, many parts to the neurons that correspond to these things called channels that tell the neuron when to spike or not. And these channels have, some of these channels have very characteristic time scales that are on the order of about 100 milliseconds. So things, which is a tenth of a second. So things tend to damp out at that rate. So you can imagine if you hit something with around 10 hertz, you could hit it in the right spot and make it go faster and faster, or make it grow, or even 20 hertz and then every other one, all right? Well, it turns out, basically, that we think what's going on with Flickr is you've got that same network that I told you about, lateral inhibition in space, along with some temporal stuff, and each time this stimulus comes along, it causes a little thing, and if it's the right frequency, that amplitude is additive and keeps growing and growing and growing. It's like this. Imagine you're bouncing a ball with a ping pong ball, okay? If you don't, if you just randomly go like that, it's not going to happen. You time your thing to hit it exactly the peak, and then that makes it go much better, all right? So here's some simulations taking that into um, that idea in mind, okay? So this is stimulating at 16 hertz, and this is at 8 hertz. <coughs> and I'm going to try and pause these. Oh, man, this thing is very sensitive. I want to pause them. Yeah. I think I'm here. Okay. I don't want to pause them yet. <laughs> All right. All right, there. Let's see. There. And this one I'll pause. There. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Who are you so wise in the ways of technology? <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is stimulating at 16 hertz. You tend to get stripes, stripe-like things. And stimulated in 8 hertz, you get hexagons, all right? 
So in fact, the frequency determines what shape you get as well. Not only do you get patterns, but there's a difference in patterns. Now, I don't want to go too much on an aside here, but what prompted my excitement about this when we saw it was in 2010, there was a paper on flicker hallucinations, and they did very careful studies of what people saw when they had these flicker when they saw these flicker phosphines. And they found that when you stimulated at high frequencies, 16 to 20 hertz, people reported seeing bullseyes and light bursts. Now you remember that retinal transform, bullseyes and light bursts correspond to stripes, okay? So at high frequencies, you see stripes. And at low frequencies, people saw checkerboards and hexagons or honeycombs, okay? So here's an example of the, simul um, of the simulation where we get exactly this, okay? We get, and it turns out there's a fundamental reason for this that you can only understand deeply through nonlinear dynamics. It turns out that there's this thing called symmetry, and at 8 hertz, you don't have this symmetry, and at 16 hertz, you do because every other cycle is missed. And when you get that symmetry, it forces you into stripes, and this forces you into honeycombs, no matter what your model is. Any model will do this. All right, so here's another example in the brain, and this is real. This is real data from a rat cortex showing spiral waves. Okay, we've done some modeling of that. I'm not going to talk about that, but that arises through interactions of inhibitory and excitatory neurons that form oscillations, and then those oscillations, because of the coupling, they organize into these spatial um, spiral waves and other things like that. One of my favorite examples of pattern formation are seashells. Well, I might finish early. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Anyway, one of my favorite examples of pattern formations is seashells. Okay, have you guys seen shells? Um, okay, these are mollusks, okay? And they make these beautiful pigments on there. And these are just gorgeous shells, okay? Over here we have um, cone shells. Cone shells are like the coolest animals. They're really cool animals. They hunt. I know it's, it's really embarrassing to be caught by a, a mollusk in a slug, but, but they have a harpoon that's filled with this highly dangerous toxin that they shoot. So a fish will swim by, they'll shoot at the fish, and the fish will drag the mollusk along and then die. And then he gets on top and he eats it. Okay? It's a tough life out there. Um, so the amazing thing to us is that these patterns are not evident in the alive animal. You don't see them. The animal is covered generally by this thing called an opercule. It's, it's covered by this opaque sheath and you can barely see the patterns in these. It's only when the animal is killed, when, you, when it dies and that falls off, that you see the pattern underneath. So these patterns don't do anything for the animal. So there, there's been many ideas about why they're there. Um, and one of the hypotheses is that as the animal's making its shell, it can sense the pigment and that tells it how far to build the shell for the next iteration. So it's a memory of where the progress of the shell is. It's sort of like, oh, I stopped here. This is where I should pick up, okay? So these are cone shells here. There's some cone shells there. There's the Nautilus. There's lots of different shells. These are from my own collection. Um, I didn't find them on the beach. I found them in a store. <laughs> now, it's better to find them on a beach, but the only ones we get on the beach are really boring. Um, although there's some really lovely ones you can get if you get spaghetti with clam sauce in Italian restaurants. There's some really nice-looking um, shells that they have there. All right, 
So we, many years ago, George Oster and I hypothesized that what we were seeing by pigmentation was essentially an electroencephalogram of the shell's nervous system that's on the mantle. So you have to understand the mantle is the part that comes out and builds the shell. It's like this giant tongue that comes out and lays down lines of shell, but it has a rich nervous system in it and it can sense things. And in fact, if you break a, sh a shell, and the animal continues to build it, you can see these defects propagate. So it's clearly using that pa pattern to move on to the next pattern. Has anybody here ever heard of a cellular automaton? Okay, some of you have, okay. Well, that's just a rule where you have a whole bunch of guys that are either zeros and ones, and it tells you how to move to the next state. And it depends only on your current state, your neighbors, and maybe some previous states, okay? So basically, the idea that we had was there's a pattern on the shell, there's a pigmentation pattern, and the sensory stuff reads this. There's excitatory guys, inhibitory guys. It, in, it um, integrates the spatiotemporal data into here, into a motor thing, and then that secretes the next level of pattern. So the model's very simple. Pigmentation at time t is just a function of the spatially averaged um, pigmentation at time t plus one. That's a Typo. It's just a nonlinear function of the averaged, the spatially averaged pigmentation of at time t minus another spatial average at time t for the inhibition, and that gives you these patterns. So these patterns turn out to be we we um, were able to mimic many of the patterns just by changing a few parameters in the model. So on the left side of each of these are seashells, real shells, and on the right are our simulations. Now, we cheat, okay? Here's how we cheat. We take sim the simulations, which just produce color in a two-dimensional array, and we map it onto the shape of the shell, and then we add lighting and stuff to make it look artistic. <laughs> okay, so that's what I mean by cheating. But the actual patterns are exactly as we do in the simulation. All right, here's some more. Okay, these are various types of cone shells. Um, Olivia porphyria, um, Conus marmoreus, um, various and sundry other cone shells, various types of cowrie type things. Okay, so basically the model is very simple. Um, I will add, I'm not going to, show you anything, but what we did was we took the patterns on 30 cone shells and we found parameters that match them. And then we took that, there was nine, nine or 12 parameters, and we put that into software that derives phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees are, are things that are used to determine the ancestry of, and the relatedness of different animals or living things, okay? They're often based on genes. Here we just based it, these, they're, they're blind to the inputs, but they produce these trees. So we produced the phylogenetic tree of these cone shells based purely on our parameters, and they match very, with, with P less than one hundredth. Um, that's a high probability. The high probability, it's, it's, the probability that it was chance is less than a one, less than one thousandth. Okay, it matches the phylogenetic trees of the actual cones as determined by their DNA. So we think that these patterns and the parameters that generate the pattern are all coded by the genes and nearby shells that are closely related will produce similar patterns because they have similar parameters. So that's it. There's universal mechanisms that underlie the generation of spatial and temporal patterns in nature. Models can make these ideas clearer. 
Even though the biology is completely different, the ideas of lateral inhibition and dynamic instability are at the core of this in a, a sort of a universal principle. So my last slide is I, I can't do any of this without all my collaborators and colleagues over the years. This is a picture from my 60th birthday. Um, most of these people are people with whom I've written papers. And I want to point out um, the most important one today is, is Pranay Go, who invite, invited me here and also asked me to give this lecture. Um, so thank you. So anybody who has questions or um, wants to try the goggles. Um. <laughs> okay, now I can't hear very well, so I... Okay, uh, so I guess, is this oh, on? Oh, sorry. Uh, is this on? Okay, yeah. So uh, before we start the question session, I would request uh, uh, the director of the planetarium, so Professor Shailaja, to give a memento on behalf of ICTS and the planetarium uh, for this wonderful lecture. So, Bart, uh, a window oh. for you. And Thank you. Okay. Huh? Uh, so, uh, Bart, would you, would you mind having a few questions? Oh, no, no. Okay. You can uh, ask, so well, I hope somebody asks questions. Some, <laughs> okay. Sometimes, so, sometimes there, people there, don't. They're shy. We don't have, we be have shy. We have lots of time for questions. Uh, so well, okay. So, it's... Okay, okay. Uh, I can't hear very well, so I might ask somebody to, <laughs> to tell. All right, so go for it. Sorry. I, I, will, I will repeat the question. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I must start by thanking you and ICTS for this absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you. And uh, it took me back to childhood because I remember vividly as a kid that uh, uh, I would press my eyes uh, like this to see patterns and I never... So I left it at that. I mean, uh, after a few years, I never, I even forgot that, that such a thing, uh, I, I, I did. But now uh, you, you made me curious again and really go explore into that and the math behind it. And that's the, the first part. And the second part I wanted to ask you uh, is, I, I know uh, a friend who works on studying the, who studies the evolution of micro ornamentation of uh, snake scales. Uh, micro micro snake scales. Snake skins. Yeah, <laughs> snake skins and the micro ornamentations uh, and how uh, it has evolved and the reasons uh, for its existence. So, uh, I, my question to you would be: Have you looked at uh, snake scales or any other reptilian scales uh, and tried to capture their math? Okay, um, reptile patterns are very cool. Um, and I have colleagues that have studied um, patterns, crocodilian skin, but I haven't myself done snake skin. Um, just as a personal note, um, I collect very old vintage fountain pens made in England in the 30s and 40s. And the most com one of the most common designs was a snake skin and a lizard skin pattern. They're very rare and very hard to find. So I love snake skins, but I've never actually modeled them. Uh, is there anybody from that side? Oh, so those who want to ask questions, can you please stand near the mic so it will be easier? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the such a astounding talk. However, I was wondering, I mean, there are two questions. For example, I would like to take the case of Vincent Van Gogh and his painting of Starry Night, for that matter. When he drew that Starry Night, which co consisted of several ADs, which were kind of in some form of synchronization with each other, I mean, what were the kind of processes that could have been going through his brain during that time? What can we be speculating on that matter? And uh, the main signals, the main uh, patterns that you uh, showed us, in that case, I mean, do human beings, can human beings, while hallucinating, uh, generate uh, fractal patterns for that matter? Uh, so these are the questions. And suppose there is a, can there be any aperiodicity in the signals that are happening? And what would be the visual representation of them uh, if a human being perceives some aperiodic uh, signals in Going processes going on his brain. All right, I got a good deal of that, but. So the first part was about starry nights. 
Van about Gogh's, which? Van Gogh Starry Nights, the patterns on Van Gogh uh, Starry Nights. Oh, the on, on the painting. Yeah, oh, the okay. Painting. So oh, yeah, yeah, Van Gogh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, I think uh, there would be. Yeah, okay, now fractal patterns. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess um, the interesting thing was that these, these patterns do look somewhat fractal anyway because, um, because of the complex logarithmic transformation. So the patterns that you see towards the center are very fine, and then they get bigger and bigger. But as far as actually generating fractals, there is lots of evidence that spontaneous activity of neurons is fractal, but that's a temporal type of time fractal. I mean, there's people, um, I have a postdoc that studies something called neural avalanches, okay? And neural avalanches, you're looking at um, cells that are in a dish, and they fire in bursts of activity, and the size of those bursts scales in a way that's that um, suggests a kind of fractal type of, of behavior. Uh, somebody from this side. Uh, thank you, sir, for your time. Uh, this is somewhat a digression and a little basic question. You talked about models or real neurons' abilities to create patterns. Uh, what do you think about the debate about how do two neurons communicate? As in, they communicate binary, but some people also think they might be able to send real values to each other. And what uh, are your theories about uh, two neurons sending each other real values? So he asked whether the communication between two neurons is binary or graded. Uh, or, yeah, on the real line. Yeah, well, I, I, OK. There are some neurons where it really is binary. But for example, in the nematode, C. elegans, the neurons, it's all graded, OK? And the, the, the people are only beginning to appreciate the, the, in, the neurons are really a very small fraction of the mass of the brain. There are these other cells called glial cells that people used to think were just there for support. But in fact, they do all kinds of things to modulate the activity, and that's at a much more analog, um, that's at a much more analog level than than the neurons do. But um, I think most of the neurons that we look at communicate mainly by spikes. Um, but there are these things called gap junctions where two neurons will sit next to each other and they're able to communicate electrical activity across there as well. But for the most part, it is in that sense binary. But there are definitely strong analog undertones. Uh, second small question, sir. Oh, sorry, can, can we... Oh, go okay. To the next question, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so we can come back. In a minute, you, you, you should have done two at once. Yeah. <laughs> like that guy. Yeah, so uh, you've basically explained that uh, we have a biological cellular automata in some form, right, which is being uh, created by the new neurons and the feedback mechanism. And uh, recently, I think in April, there was a news of how they found a lizard skin to actually represent the digital cellular automata where the pattern of its skin forms the game of life essentially. So uh, what I was uh, asking about is uh, cellular automata are uh, now being found to be methods of computation, right? You can use a cellular automata to perform transformations and uh, do a kind of feature detection and remove noise and things like that. So uh, is there any research showing that these kind of uh, cellular automata are represented in the biology of the visual cortex do some pre-processing of the images to the brain. Is it a computational mechanism? So, what about it? Are, are connected to, so I, I don't know if I fully understood your question. I'm trying to translate it for uh, him. What I'm saying is <laughs> sorry, the, the sorry, mechanism I can't, that I'm, is I, basically a set of cells which have feedback amongst each other, right, to their neighbors. Yeah. And that is essentially a cellular automata in a more analog way of looking at it. So I'm asking if it forms a computational layer to pre-process the images to the brain. Oh, pre-pro... What? Yeah. Whether, whether the... Uh, oh, there's lots of pre-processing. Whether, whether it can be thought of as a cellular automation. Oh, I, I... You know, there was a book written called A New Kind of Science back in the... Um, 
I think probably 10, 15, 15 years ago by Stephen Wolfram, all right? Um, you can take a look. I wrote a review of that book for a, um, I think for the notices of the American Mass Society. Um, I had a rather dim view of the idea that everything is essentially a cellular automata. So I, I think it's a fine as an analogy, but I don't think it's a new kind of science. And I don't think it's the, if you want to talk to biologists, um, you really have to talk to them in language that they know. Um, I have a really off-color joke about that, that if you want to come up and ask me about it, I can tell you. But, but it's one that I would never do in this venue. Um. <laughs> okay, uh, other question? Uh, thank you for uh, coming to India and making the science such exciting uh, here. Uh, I want, my question is, uh, how do you distinguish uh, the Neolithic and Paleolithic pictures of the paintings? How do you distinguish whether these are drawn with right hand or left hand? Is it possible to distinguish by seeing the picture if there is any scientific technique to do that? So how Whether you can distinguish whether it was drawn by left hand or right hand. <laughs> that came out of left field. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, you know, I, I will tell you this. I, I can tell when I'm grading papers whether, the, whether it was written by somebody that was Chinese and whether it was written by somebody that was Indian because of the way the letters are formed. But I, I don't know that I could distinguish. I, I, I left or right-handed. I. I guess depending on how it slants, but uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I don't think I quite understood the question. Yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. Can you distinguish left from right hand? I, I don't know. I think that's... I mean, okay, so maybe we can go to the I next. Put, I can put, sorry. I'm a sorry. Huh? Uh, I can just uh, add on to what all, uh, because I am a latecomer, I may not have got complete point. If we can know that, the, whether the letter has been written by the left hand or the right hand, so my investigation point of view, suppose if you want to find out a particular person, then it would be more uh, easy. So in that angle, uh, my interest, I am just putting it now. Can you identify the person if it is written? That's what. So, so they want to know if it's possible to identify from writing whether the person is left or right-handed. Oh, or I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> not from my writing. Um, my writing is the students who sat through my 12 hours of lecture will tell you is random. Uh, uh, other question from that side? Uh, okay, so somebody else. So thank you for the great talk, sir. Uh, so you're talking about, um, sorry, uh, entropic phenomenon, uh, entropic phenomenon and uh, visual stimuli gave some patterns in the eye. So you gave two examples of 16 hertz signal and 8 hertz signal, right, which gave different, like 8 hertz signal gave a uh, hexagonal pattern and a 16 hertz signal gave a, gave a different pattern. So let's assume a case of a synesthetic brain, a brain with synesthesia. So synesthesia, where audita auditory... Synesthesia? I don't know what that means. Oh, synesthesia. Yes. Where where <laughs> okay, yeah. Where, audita where auditory pattern... I actually had a student study synesthesia a little bit, but... Where auditory, uh, what do you say, auditory um, yeah. disturbance would leave you to a visual no, this pattern. Is a, this is, I think, I, I, you're kind of hinting at something that has, has bothered me, not bothered, but thought about this for years, okay? And that is, we kind of have a good idea what visual hallucinations look like, visual hallucinations, because they seem to correspond to certain geometric patterns in the, the, the visual cortex because there's this map from the visual world that is space dependent on the cortex. So if I have a point here and a point here, two points in the cortex fire it the same way. Auditory cortex is organized in a very different way. It's organized spatially the space in auditory cortex doesn't correspond to space in reality. It corresponds to something called 
tonotopy. It corresponds to different tones. And in fact, I had a bunch of students thinking about this, that what would it sound like if we impose, because visual cortex and auditory cortex in terms of the connectivity, the parts, and everything else are basically the same. So if you can generate geometric patterns spontaneously on visual cortex, maybe you can on auditory cortex, but how would that be perceived? And we couldn't, we, we tried a bunch of different things and it just sounded like noise. <laughs> so maybe there is an idea that, that this might be related to something called tinnitus, okay? So people that have tinnitus hear sounds all the time in their ears, and they can be different, they're very specific frequencies. So it could be such a pattern persisting in a local area of cortex, which is why you think you hear this. I, I, I should say one more though, is in the skin, the skin, there is a spatial map from the, the um, somatosensory cortex, that's, that's the part of the brain that deals with this body surface. And in Kluver's book, he talks about people who took mescaline feeling like their arms were covered with cobwebs. So <laughs> there was an example of the geometric patterns appearing spontaneously on his skin. And people that drink a lot and then stop drinking, they suffer for something called um, formication. There's an M in there, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, formication, it's the feeling of being surrounded by ants. And that's also probably some sort of a hallucination. <clears throat> Other questions? Yeah. So for the entoptic vision, what I understood was that uh, there is a spatial uh, pattern on the cortex, which is, which is because of some simulation, which is uh, affecting uh, some transformed uh, uh, pattern on the retina. So, for, so my question is that uh, why did you consider a 2D pattern on the cortex and is it possible to have 3D patterns or will it affect, because there is no conformal transformation from a 3D to a 2D, so would it affect something? Uh, Wait, some patterns where else? So is, is it, uh, are there patterns in three dimensions in the cortex? Oh, 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 okay. Actually, I thought you were asking something else, so I'll say something about that too, but first, the first question is cortex is basically a sheet that is organized into six layers, okay? And those layers are different in the sense of what they do. So most input from the sensory system comes into layer four, with some layers coming into five, and then layer two, three is where all the most of the spatial structure is, and that goes back to layer five, and there's, so it really is actually a very complicated two-dimensional sheet, and the third dimension is just all these, um, all these layers. We've just started looking at multiple layer models, not in the context of hallucinations, which is too hard, but in the context of, of propagating waves, which you see very commonly. What I thought you were asking was these, these patterns that I talk about here are primarily in primary visual cortex called V1. That's the lowest, cort that's the first area of cortex. And as you get higher up, you get into parts of the cortex that, that if you stimulate it, you'll see faces, okay? And because cortex is cortex, you can start to ask, if you start to get these kinds of instabilities in higher areas of cortex, then you won't see stripes, because stripes in geometry is just a consequence of the fact that at that level, cortex is only interested in orientation and spatial location, okay? But higher up, it's put all these features together. So you can imagine, if I could speculate a little bit, that if this hallucination or whatever, this in instability migrated up to, say, facial cor um, parietal or parts where the face, facial parts of the cortex, you might start to see, like, faces looking all over you, and you could start to explain some 
you know, paranoid delusions that people see. And also, apparently, as you, when you take LSD, early on in the, in the experience, you see geometric patterns, but later on, the patterns become much more complex. And the idea there is that instability is propagating up through primary visual cortex to more complicated cortices. Sir, so I have two questions over here. Can auditory signals give rise to visual uh, patterns in the brain or vice versa? And uh, how do uh, naturally born blind people uh, experience uh, like hallucinations or patterns ah, in the brain? Excellent question. Excellent question. Okay. First of all, it depends on how you're blind. Okay. Naturally blind. If you're cortically blind, blind that means that there's no visual cortex, then you can't, you're not going to get any of these hallucinations. But if you're, born, if you're blind because of, say, some sort of retinal atrophy or your eyeballs were m malformed, then what people, blind people see these hallucinations oftentimes all the time. Okay, because they're in isolate. It's almost like you've isolated the cortex. And as I said early in my lecture, the cortex kind of gets bored, and so it starts to geometrically um, do these things. I'll, I'll tell you a couple uh, or one one specific example. A uh, number of years ago, this guy I mentioned, Oliver Sacks, sent me a letter because I had made a comment on his blog, and Oliver Sacks had um, he had cancer of the eye. Okay, and they had to cut out part of the cancer. And so he had this, he'd see a scene and there was this big blank spot. And he said in his letter, and he said it in his books too, that blank spot would often fill with flickering geometric patterns. So what was happening it was there was no more input into that little local area. And again, it was becoming excited and generating these patterns. So blind people do hallucinate if they're not cortically blind. Uh, and one more. Uh, so, sorry. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> so I guess the other part of his question was about auditory oh. signals exciting visual patterns. Can, oh, you oh, you know. Actually, I don't know. It's a good question. I have this app on my phone called Get High Now, okay? <laughs> and it's, um, <laughs> and it, it's supposed to give, it, you, you do these binaural beats and things like that. And some of these beats are supposed to, if you close your eyes, you're supposed to see some geometric patterns too. So maybe. I haven't gotten it to work because it's supposed to be binaural and I can't hear out of my left ear. <laughs> okay. Uh, other question? Uh, you have a question? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah I kind of wanted to uh, ask you about something that I find really uh, interesting and kind of scary about the brain. Right? So the brain really knows how to, uh, you know, play tricks with you, kind of. Right. So, for example, um, I would want to know what you think of this. So this is the first part of the question. Right. So. Uh, in case of tinnitus and ear uh, problems, what if the brain at a younger age, suppose you're going to go deaf at some particular age, but at, at a younger age, the brain starts sending signals in the form of ad auditory hallucinations. So if, if, a, if, uh, if a person is not influenced by society and continues to pursue those hallucinations and somehow creates beings and things out of them, would he be able to ex escape uh, tinnitus or... Um, Deafness. Uh, so, so, sorry. I, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> he has uh, a complex mechanism for trying to. It's escape not a mechanism. It's I a, don't really it's understand. So maybe uh, you can explain this way, over. Right? So, can, could you example, please explain this over the tea? That's easier. Over uh, the instead of me, over the tea and coffee. Uh, instead of me uh, trying to. That'd be easier your question, to talk one on one. I yeah, think it's easier, easier to just talk one on one. Because sure, long question. Just one on one. The, the acoustics. I have a shorter question. Yeah, yeah. I have a hearing aid, and they really. Glasses work great. People, people have mastered glasses because it's really simple. All you have to do is a lens. But hearing aids, all kinds of digital processing. And in big rooms with this acoustics, it's really hard for me to hear. So I, I'm sorry. Cool. Uh, the next question, next thing is, um, so you talked about hallucinations and stuff, but 
there are people who take heavy drugs like ayahuasca and uh, you know ceremonial drugs like mescaline. So could you uh, could we also discuss this outside, please? But but uh, it's so just a simple yeah. thing. <laughs> just a simple thing. This right? guy, like, are you? Is this guy a philosopher? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a writer <laughs> basically. So I think yeah. I, in my mind. So, so I think could you please uh, pass on to uh, discuss these questions? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Next oh, this guy got a second question. Yeah, he had a second question. He has been waiting. So, <laughs> oh, uh, this is a simple question. Uh, uh, you talked about uh, hallucinations and patterns. Uh, I just wanted to know how objective are they? Like, is there any correlation between two people uh, having the same hallucination? So, just uh, talking about the objectivity of it, uh, or is it subjective? It differs from person to person. So, so how how, uh, subje how objective or subjective are hallucinations? Oh, uh, okay. Is it the same no, for different people. No, that's a very good question, and in fact, it makes it very hard to measure these, to quantify them. So what we did last year is I collaborated with a fellow in Aus Australia who does psychophysics. Okay, and what what people do with Flickr normally is you look in two dimensions. Okay. Oh, psychophysics isn't what you think it is. Okay, <laughs> it's not like an insane Richard Feynman or something like that. Okay, <laughs> so so psychophysics is is um, it's a psychology plus physics sort of. Okay, so anyway, um, this guy we we decided he decided he came up with this idea, um, Joel Pearson that. Maybe it would be much better if we could somehow reduce the dimensionality of the hallucinations so we could quantify them. So instead of looking at a full field flicker, he made an annulus that flickered. And what you perceive when you see the annulus flicker is you see blobs and they're very regularly spaced and you can count them and you can study how many there are as a function of frequency of the the flicker. So in other words, you can do quantified things with this now and really make them truly objective. Okay, so I think uh, we have had uh, many questions. There is still time for questions outside uh, over tea and coffee. So could we... Uh, Let a woman... Oh, yeah, we haven't had a... Have a it's all been guys. Come on. It's just <laughs> Sorry. One... Uh, one. One more. Uh, one, break, but, uh, one more, just one more, just one. I'd like to know if neural activity is distribution free, underlying distribution free. Is it distribution free? I, do not I don't know, know what which, that means. Yeah, which <laughs> uh, neural activity, uh, the patterns that, uh, that, uh, that it gives rise to, is, the, is it dependent on some probability distribution? Or is it dependent on some probability distribution? Oh, 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 these? Well, I mean, you know, these are deterministic models. <laughs> so they, you can throw noise in there. Um, this sort of stuff, I mean, I, I, I'll say no. No. Okay. 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 Thank you. You have a question. question. Yes. Uh, so you, you talked about two types of uh, neurons in a broad classification. One's dot fire and one's that inhibit. Yes. And uh, you, you describe their behavior in terms of uh, two ordinary nonlinear differential equations. That's correct. How were you able to reduce uh, this uh, huge set of degrees of freedom to just two simple equations? Hand waving. No, there are ways to do it. For the most part, okay. Let, let, me, let, me, let me talk a little bit about philosophy of modeling, okay? There is a project ongoing in Europe now called the Blue Brain Project, okay? Henry Markram runs it, okay? And it's, it's the Swiss, um, Swiss, and it is a billion dollars, and his goal is to make a realistic, and I put that in quotes, model of one little slab of visual cortex, okay? Maybe it's somatosensory cortex, but a piece of cortex, okay? And so he's got million, hundreds of thousands of neurons. Each of these neurons has all these complex structures. And the claim is he's going to get insight 
into how the brain works from looking at this. Okay? There are many, many people out there, many good scientists, even me, <laughs> that, that think this is not a good idea. Because, for one thing, we don't know what's going out, on out there. He's picking random values for parameters. There's millions of parameters there. It's very, very underdetermined <laughs> how he chooses these. So what we think of, now, now I should say that there are ways to um, principally reduce simple ionic, okay, so let me, let me say a little bit. Neurons, neurons can be modeled Let's, let's just take what I call a point neuron. We'll forget all that complicated stuff. Point neuron consists of many things called channels. Okay, these channels, open, and typically there are dozens of differential equations just for each neuron, okay? But there are ways under certain circumstances, certain mathematical circumstances, where you can principally reduce these to much simpler systems. I had you... You could go watch the videos of my 12 hours of lecture <laughs> last week, <laughs> right? That, that would sort of answer some of those, right? <laughs> so I did talk a lot about that. So yeah, people do do these large scale simulations, and, but for the large spatial scales that I'm looking at, it's just not possible. And so we, we treat these fairly abstractly, but they do make concrete predictions. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, if not, let's. Uh, there, are, there are some hands sort of say randomly going up and down. I'm not sure if that's a question or not. If you do have a question, raise your hand so that I can see it. But uh, uh, okay. So maybe last two and so uh, please. I wanted to know uh, how do these patterns arise in case of dreams? which is different from a hallucination caused by a drug wherein we are induce, inducing something and also some visual hallucinations because of um, damage to the eye or cortex. How do we form dreams? How do we see dreams? Why? Right. How do we see dreams? How do we see? Dream. If Green? No, dream. Dreams. Dreams. Yeah. Oh, dreams. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> no, I actually people know a little bit more about dreams now than they used to, and I don't really study dreams very much. But but dreams, um, dreams are a very hyper excited state, and what they found is in in rodents. Okay, rodents that suppose the rodents walk through a new environment. Okay, there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus, okay? And as they walk through the environment, the brain is turning on in sequence. And what people have found is by recording from the brains of these rodents when they're sleeping, is that during their sleep, they're replaying these patterns in their head. So it could very well be that dreams are either a replaying of something that happened or they're trying to make sense of some garbled, random activity. Um, as you know, humans are really great at seeing patterns where there are none. That's the whole basis of the internet conspiracy theories, right? So, so you know, the brain just wants to do that. Okay, uh, maybe last question. Uh, how are the... Uh, Visionary patterns that is showed initially are connected or similar to the patterns in the Malux uh, that is showed after that. Uh, how how they are connected? How how similar they are? So, sorry, sorry. sorry. The, the, the visual patterns. Huh? The, pat the visual patterns. Mm -hmm. The patterns on the Malux. Oh, oh, okay. How All right. right. So how similar are they? Okay. Some of the patterns are very similar. Okay, but. You have to understand that the patterns in the mollusk are really one dimension in space. And, and you're seeing a time sequence. Now, some of those are very simple um, spots and things like that. And you can understand that from this kind of instability. The other ones 
are much harder to understand and require looking at full nonlinear equations because some of them are like waves that fail to propagate or waves that annihilate or waves that cross through each other, things like that. Um, one of the papers, we discuss all the different patterns and what the underlying temporal and spatial mechanisms are. Okay, uh, so I think we have uh, lots of time over, hopefully over coffee and tea outside. So let's uh, thank Bart again for a great lecture. <laughs>